you so much for having me. You guys, I'm a bundle of nerves. I'm a bundle of nerves because um, this is a group of friends and it's much harder to do these sorts of things in front of people you um, trust, admire, and respect. And thank you for bearing with me if I stumble a little bit this morning. Okay, first of all, before we talk about babies, um, I'm just gonna say I took one for the team here. I am not in this photo to tell my kids I was with Han Solo and MC Hammer because I'm taking this picture and Daniel Craft, you owe me. All right, there we go. Okay, I'm starting with um, this photograph of my grandmother, Anna, and my dad as a newborn. My grandmother had rheumatic heart disease as a baby. It was the most common and deadly um, disease of childhood in the time, so probably in the mid-1800s on through about 1940. My father also had rheumatic heart disease as a child. It took him fully a year to recover from that. And 19 years later, he joined the US Navy and was uh, an engineering brain already. He was assigned to a heavy aircraft bomber doing the sonar work. So they would drop depth charges in and mini bombs and listen. They were looking for submarines. He was stationed in Panama and the Panama Canal was the US most prized asset at the time and so they needed to make sure nothing was gonna come around and take it. And um, the, the charges that they would drop and the listening tools that they would drop had to be able to be heard from a plane that was flying far above the ocean. And when my dad told me this story about a year before he died, I was just like, my dad's like totally like, hunt for Red October, this is amazing. I never knew this about his background. And really that work in the military predates modern medical ultrasound by less than a decade. So it really was laying the foundation for how we ping a piece of sound into something, we listen for what comes back and then we can actually visualize what comes back. So, um, a few years later, in 19, well, actually the same year, um, this is when my grandmother, at 44 years old, became Dr. Walt Lillehei's third patient on the heart-lung machine. This is Minnesota innovation that we still talk about in my great state, which is Medical Alley, of course, so I feel really privileged to live there. But that surgery bought her four more years of life. Four more years of life. That was remarkable at the time. And so, um, I'm gonna fast forward now to when my third child was born in 2000, at the very, very tail end of 2008, I put 2009 because all of the drama kicked in right away. But um, she had a perfectly um, normal coming into this world. I had a completely uneventful pregnancy. Oh, by the way, before I forget, daisies here. I'm just thinking, I've got to get a lot of shit done in the next five years because I was full on menopause at 48. And that was not long after I had my two girls in my 40s. And her data was like a remarkable thing to see and, and, and learn about because I've been in a hot flash for five years now. But this experience um, of having a, a baby that looked perfectly healthy or celebrating everything about having that baby um, kind of crashed and burned right before discharge. The rounding pediatrician heard a little bit of a murmur which is very common in newborns. I would say um, about 20% of babies have them. And so they're usually just followed up at the one week well visit. That was what our pediatrician was gonna do, send us home for um, a normal schedule and we'll check up on it then. She came back 30 minutes later and said she had heard that there was a pediatric echo cart, one of those big machines that gets rolled around in the big hospitals, that had been brought over to my delivery hospital with a technician that was trained in doing newborn ultrasound. And that um, was there to look at another baby. And she's like, it's already here. I don't want you to worry, you're a new mom, you don't need the stress, let's get Eve in there to take a look. And an hour later, there was a cardiologist standing in our door telling us our daughter was in heart failure. I remember clearly telling him he was in the wrong room, that there was another baby in the hospital he needed to be talking to, and he said, no, it's not another baby, it's your baby. So she had to be moved immediately by LifeLink Transport to a 
um, Children's Hospital. Fortunately, we have three heart centers in Minnesota, two of which are in the Twin Cities, and the other is Mayo Clinic, Clinic. So it was not a difficult transport, but it wasn't a blizzard, and it was 10 miles, and the prep they have to put a newborn through to go on a life link is quite something. Um, and she didn't do well. That first week was a tough go. We talked to the surgeon. We talked about putting her on the transplant list. Her heart was three times the size it should have been. That was when we were being discharged to home, and she looked perfectly normal. And so if you can imagine what that's like for any family experiencing uh, the new and the novel about a diagnosis, um, it was earth shattering and we didn't know which way was up. We didn't leave the hospital. I had another baby at home. My kids are only about 15 months apart. And um, we waited and talked to the doctors every single day to figure out what we should do next and try to get a formal diagnosis of something more than just heart failure. So her mitral valve was defective. It didn't, um, the cord eye attaching that leaflet didn't, didn't grow properly, so it couldn't open and close properly. And mitral valve de defects in children are actually very, very rare at birth. And she, on top of that, had something called Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, which is, uh, an accessory electrical pathway in the heart that causes arrhythmia, in her case, supraventricular tachycardia, where her heart would just pop into 340 beats a minute out of, from a sneeze, from a little baby sneeze. And this started happening around the clock, 24 hours a day, and her heart needed to be shocked back into rhythm um, from her uh, lines, which were feeding her body with adenosine. So she was on about nine different medications around the clock to keep her heart functioning. She kind of turned a corner, so we bought ourselves about another month, to two months before we had to go um, all the way to Boston Children's. There were only two hospitals in the United States that would even consider ablating an eight-pound baby. Texas Children's and Boston Children's. And there was only two places that would consider operating on that mitral valve on such a young child. That was uh, Frank Hanley at Stanford and Pedro Del Nido in Boston. So you do the little Venn diagram, that takes us to Boston, and, and off we went. She is a miracle by medical standards. What they did to repair her heart that was the size of a walnut was truly still shown in case studies today. When she was repaired, she suddenly could eat and grow and become the baby we thought we were gonna bring home as a newborn. Gratitude is an understatement. What I didn't realize through our journey was A, how many kids have heart defects, one to two percent of all newborns, it's a lot of babies. But did you know that in our own country, one third of kids with congenital heart disease were being discharged from the newborn nursery without a diagnosis? Shocking, right? One out of six of those babies would be diagnosed by the morgue. I went to many funerals that first year of babies in coffins the size of shoeboxes. What we did with that was take our journey to um, the federal level after pulling together a uh, pilot study among six hospitals in Minnesota to look at whether newborn pulse oximetry screening could be a tool for every baby in the well baby nursery to flag heart problems. And a year later, the Secretary of Health and Human Services decided that every baby in this country should be screened for heart defects before they leave the hospital. 55 million and counting have been screened so far. Okay, the spin-off of that. What do we need to figure out besides a baby that's symptomatic, right? Or flagged by a pulse oximetry screen. That's just hypoxemia, that's just abnormal oxygen saturations. We needed ultrasound. Here's what those carts look like. This one happens to be in Mongolia, so it's not nearly as fancy or as expensive as the ones my daughter gets her echocardiograms on. But we went on to figure out how to get um, toward an automated image acquisition tool. And that was the trick, right? AI and machine learning were already coming a long way down the road. But automating image acquisition was the really tricky thing. And so we did a proof of concept grant, ended up bringing together a team about three or three and a half-ish years ago, focusing on using chip-based ultrasound as a alternative to piezoelectric crystals that are packed in the head. So you can see our prototype right there flipped over in the hand of the doctor 
Um, that one is about the size of a thumbnail. The new one that's on the back of this little, little guy here is about half that size, about the size of a pinky nail. And those lines, those tiny dots there, are the things that we have a little bit of control over that allow that sensor to do beam steering. So um, all of my animations are, are gone this morning so, <laughs> so that we didn't um, bog things down on the tech side. But this is a little baby in India as part of our clinical trial there. Um, and there's another one where you can see the type of low resource settings that we've designed this technology to work in. And this was our first child that we actually picked up with our prototype. This was baby number nine that we screened that day at the Milana Azad Medical College, which is the largest public hospital in Delhi. And she had a Swiss cheese ASD VSD presentation, um, and she was in heart failure. This child would have waited three months just to get an ultrasound. She was scheduled for surgery the very next week. Our largest pilot project right now has been going on for just shy of a, a year, um, but we're in data collection in uh, three different states in Mexico, onboarding a fourth, working with the Ministry of Health and University partners in those places. This device um, still has its tail. It plugs into a tablet or a phone, so that allows us to get um, the images we need to see to compare with an FDA-cleared predicate device. So as part of a, the, the, it's a startup pathway you've heard a lot about from the other presenters this week, this is, um, this is where we're at. It's, trying to demonstrate substantial equivalence on the hardware side, but then build those machine learning algorithms to give confidence on the front end that um, those primary care users in the most remote places will have the information they need to refer the child onward or keep that child right where they are in their community of care if they don't need to be moved onward. This was a little baby from two weeks ago in Mexico, just a joy um, to be around. And this is our, one of our cardiologists that flew in from Mongolia. She's doing her training there and helping us do a curriculum with the medical school um, in Mexico and working with the Society of Echocardiography on ultrasound screening. That is a thing that doesn't exist, just like newborn pulse oximetry screening didn't exist. So having sort of that grand swell behind us to move this forward is going to be amazing. And I believe in it so much, and I thank Dave Zabonski for actually teaching all of us in this meeting how to generate that ground swell of enthusiasm for the same thing that my family believes in so deeply and the team at Bloom Standard believes in so deeply. So I just wanted to share these last bit of partners. Um, we were included in the World Health Organization's Compendium of Innovative Health Technologies, which is sort of like the Bible for global health funders that purchase for countries and governments in low resource settings. And we have the offices now, as I mentioned, in the UK and Wales. So working closely with the NHS y to deploy. And the next step is the creation of a prototype of low cost that permita hacer ecocardiografías en cualquier lugar donde no haya cardiólogos pediatras, donde no haya equipos sofisticados. That is the goal, to get to where there is nothing now. And believe it or not, 95% of the children in our very own country don't have access to ultrasound in their local communities of care. They have to go to the children's hospital or a large academic center to get that scan. We're trying to solve that problem. I'm grateful every day that my daughter had access to the diagnosis and the treatment she did. Every child deserves that same opportunity. I would like to acknowledge that one of the reasons I'm hugely nervous today is because my children are here, including my daughter Eve. So this is her artwork and just know it is worth it. All of it is worth it. So please, please keep doing what you're doing. If there's anything that I can share more with you with my little baby and my little prototype afterwards, I'm happy to do that. Eve, would you mind just standing up at least? You don't have to come up here if it's going to freak you out, but at least stand up for us because I'm so proud of you. <laughs> so much. One quick question. Yes. Um, what can the Nextman Health community do to help accelerate this into the world? Oh boy, you haven't heard this before. We're fundraising. So yeah, there's that. Um, look, we're, we're so blessed to have the sorts of research partners that we have around the world. Um, 
it's one of the things we don't struggle with is looking for like clinical trial sites and clinical validation sites because we have so many strong partners there. But on the tech side, um, on the, the the partnerships with um, the sensors and manufacturing. I mean, all of this is the pre-commercialization stage for us, which is so critical. And I'm telling you, if you don't have enough resources to pay your engineers to get to the next milestone, it'll kill a company. So we'd appreciate your support or your ideas. Great, find her. Thanks.